Come and sing. This is the day that the Lord has made. Your turn. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. morning. Come on in where the table is spread and the feast of the Lord is going on. We welcome you to the First Baptist Church of Crown Heights virtual service. We offer many online services for you to experience all week long. Join us on Sunday at 9 a.m. for Sunday School led by Reverend Caton on Zoom. On Mondays to replay Sunday Sermon and enjoy biblical highlights as you watch. Tune in to Flashback First Baptist on Tuesday evenings at 6.30 p.m. on Facebook Live. Then on Wednesday evenings, enjoy sound biblical teachings and great discussions during our Pastor and People Bible Study at 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. On Thursday, start your day off right with our morning prayer call at 7 a.m. On First Sundays, when you tune into our services, you can commune with us. Well, we have given you the menu, and the spiritual table is set. All you have to do is eat up and enjoy. You are here. You are here. Thank you for being here today. While you're here, hope you hear something that inspires you to Our scripture this morning takes us further into our series through the story of the great becoming in Exodus. I want you to turn this morning to the book of Exodus chapter 4, verses 10 through 17. And then we're going to jump over to the New Testament to John 14, 12, as well as Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. Most of them will be familiar to you. But Exodus chapter 4 reads, Moses raised another objection to God. Master, please, you know I don't talk very well. I've never been good with words, neither before nor after you spoke to me. I stutter and I stammer. God said, and who do you think made the human mouth? And who makes some mute and some deaf and some sighted and some blind? Isn't it I, God? So get going. I'll be right there with you with your mouth. I'll be right there to teach you what to say. And in John 14, 12, Jesus tells his disciples, believe me, I am, I am in my father and my father is in me. If you can't believe that, believe what you see. Believe these works. The person who trusts in me will not only do what I am doing, but even greater things. Because I, on my way to the father, I am giving you the same work to do that I've been doing. I am on my way to the Father, Jesus says, but I'm going to give you the same work to do that I have been doing. And then Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21, the apostle Paul says to the church at Ephesus, now unto him who is able to do exceeding 
abundantly above all that we could ask, think, or imagine, according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of this word and sanctify to the good of our souls. Shall we pray? He that has begun a great work in you is able to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that you still call us to great work. As a matter of fact, God, we are your masterpiece because we are pieces of the master. So we thank you, O oh God, that you're continuing to work on us and to walk with us and to talk to us and to strengthen us and to lead us and to call us to greater work. We ask now, O oh God, for your spirit right in our homes. Let this word, O oh God, transform a life. Let this word save a dying soul. Let this word empower someone to live out their best life. Let this word, O oh God, discipline someone to great work. This is our prayer today through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the people of God said, amen and amen. This morning, I want to preach to you from the subject, a great yet unfinished work. A great yet unfinished work. Have you ever noticed that life really doesn't make sense to us until we look back? It was Soren Kierkegaard, one of my favorite philosophers, who said that life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived moving forward. As I begin to think about our first year as pastor and people, it's amazing to see how God ordered our steps even when it did not make sense to us just 12, 13, 14 months ago. It's amazing how God sees in us what we cannot see in ourselves. God sees how things will unfold when it doesn't seem to make sense to us in that moment. And beloved, that is the story of the call of Moses to leadership in a nutshell. The community of Israel had been suffering through 200 years of Egyptian slavery, and God has seen the affliction of his people. God has heard their cry for help. He has listened to their groaning in the midnight of captivity, and God has now come to deliver them out of the hands of Pharaoh by using a brother named Moses. Moses, which means draw out. God calls Moses to go to Pharaoh in order to bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He who was rescued out of the Nile River has now been called to rescue his people out of captivity. If anybody was qualified for the job, surely it was Moses. He's been afforded the privileges and opportunities that others have not had. He's been on the mountaintop and has seen the burning bush. He has experience as a shepherd leading sheep. He has been raised in Pharaoh's house. He knows the language and the tricks of the oppressor. He is the man for the job. And God calls him because... He has the pedigree. He has the experience to lead the people out of Israel. But even though God called him and experience equipped him and education qualified him, he's still having trouble accepting the call. And there, beloved, goes the tapes again. Last week, it was the tape of deterrence that made him believe that the people would not listen to him that made him believe that the people would not even believe in him. And this week, we now see that Moses has another tape that he needs to have popped by God. This week's tape is the tape of perfection. There is something that keeps telling this brother that he is not perfect, that he is not ready for the job because he has some difficulties. He has some challenges. Moses rejects the call because he has a speech impediment. And Moses said to God, he says, now, Lord, now, listen here. Now, 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 now you know me. I, I, I stutter and, and, and I, and I got a stammer. I, 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 I don't have a perfect speech. I'm not a man of words. I am not a very convincing speaker. Now, now, now you know, there are other people out there who speak better than I do. Now, you know, they, there are people out there who, who can say a lot with words, but you, you know, you don't want me out there. Moses is telling God, the last thing you want is for me to go out there and speak on your behalf 
and the people make fun of me because, you know, I got a, I, I stutter. And God asked Moses, he said, now, now Moses, now you stutter, but somehow you found a good way to come up with another excuse. Who, and God said, now who made your mouth? Who makes some people mute and some people deaf and some people sighted and some people blind? Who gave you your mouth and your ears and your eyes? I believe it was me. Who, who's the creator? I, God said, I am the creator. Matter of fact, God said, I am the giver of the human resources. And your request now, Moses, has now been denied. Because stuttering and stammering is not an excuse for not accepting the call on your life. You, you can't get out of this one. Just, just go forward. As a matter of fact, you, don't, you, you can't get out of this, Moses. This is, you can't get out of this one. Matter of fact, I know you got excuses, but you, you can't get out of this one. As a matter of fact, prior experience is not even necessary for this call. Because the Bible says, I offer on-the-job training. Because I'll go with you. And matter of fact, not only will I go with you, but I will give you the words to say when you don't know what to say. So your stuttering and your stammer is no excuse for not being successful. And beloved, you know what's crazy? There are a lot of people in the world who stutter. There are a lot of people in the world who stammer. There are a lot of people in the wor world who have an issue with getting their words out of their mouths. There are a lot of people who have imperfections and they have disabilities and they're differently abled. Come on here. Stuttering is not a stumbling block to success. I think somebody needs to hear that this morning. Stumbling and stuttering and stammer is not an excuse for not being successful. Oh, yes, yeah, sometimes we learn how we stutter, but God shows us how to discipline our minds, how to practice, how to focus in order to get past our stuttering. Am I making sense this morning? Samuel Jackson spent a year not talking because he had a severe stutter. People in his high school made fun of him because he stuttered so bad. And he still, to this day, is still having issues with stuttering. But you know what, beloved? Samuel Jackson stutters, but it has not become a stumbling block to the man who is the highest grossing actor in Hollywood. Stuttering is no excuse for not being successful. Kendrick Lamar, the Pulitzer Prize winning artist, he said that he had an issue with stuttering and he took all of his energy and put it into his music in order to get his words out. And his stuttering did not become an excuse for not being successful. As a matter of fact, the vice president, Joe Biden, fought his stuttering by reciting Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson in his bedroom. And he worked on that stutter until he got himself together. And even, you saw the debate two weeks ago, he was still having some challenges with his stuttering, but it still got him to the White House. And I'm still, oh, Lord. I was about to say he could also become something else, but I'm standing in the pulpit, and I can't endorse a candidate in the church, so I'll just leave that alone. But James Earl Jones, the voice of Mufasa, the voice of Darth Vader on Star Wars, he also had a stuttering problem. Uh, an English teacher in high school who discovered that when I read my own poetry, that I, I didn't stutter because I wasn't in confrontation with other people's uh, feelings or thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. but my own. And it came up a little better, so I, I practiced reading poetry for a while, and I think that's what got me into uh, a feeling for uh, reading dramatic things or dramatic interpretations. And it was so bad that he did not speak for eight years, but you know what? He said he didn't get cured of his stuttering. He learned how to work with his stuttering by reading poetry in class. The world, beloved, is filled with people who have learned how to stutter and stammer their way into success. People who have dealt with the pain and embarrassment and ridicule. People who have stayed up in the wee hours of the night learning how to climb over stumbling blocks. People who have spent time with the speech therapists in school learning how to get their thoughts out eloquently and clearly. But the secret to overcoming our stuttering because we all got a stutter of some sense or some sort, is to put your life in proper perspective. It's not even about the stuttering. It's about putting your life in proper perspective. God pops our tapes of imperfection to shift our perspective. Somebody needs to know this this morning, that you don't have to be perfect. You just have to shift your perspective. That's good. You've got to get your focus right. Ask, I mean, listen, y'all. 
For half of my pastorate this year, I have spent six to seven or eight months now looking at a camera. I don't see 800 people, 1,000 people on Sunday. I see this one camera every week. And one lesson that I've learned over these last eight months looking at this camera is that everything about this camera is about perspective. The person in front of the camera is just as important as the person who is behind the camera or the person who is in the studio working to edit this video every week, every week, week after week. And the secret to the success of it all is learning how to get your focus right. You've got to get your perspective right. You, you can have the right person in the frame, but if your perspective is off, the whole message falls flat. I want you to remember back in the day, remember back in the day when we had video cameras and we got that, I had an uncle, you had an uncle too, who recorded everything in the family. And in my grandmama's house, she had videotapes of a bunch of family gatherings. You remember back in the day, when we used to videotape family, family reunions, and you would sit down and look at a videotape that somebody sent you from down south, and it would be 45 minutes of people eating chicken and potato salad in some Elks Lodge in the middle of nowhere down south. And often, it was the uncle behind the camera who was playing with the Zoom button. And all of a sudden, you spent 10 minutes watching somebody eat chicken and potato salad, and you don't know what else happened in that room because they were Zoomed in too much on one person that they missed the essence of the event. Am I making sense of this? They zoomed in so close that they, you don't even know what else was going on because they were in the right place, but their perspective was off. And I'm telling you, beloved, if you zoom in too much on the story, you'll lose focus of the big picture. If you zoom in too much on yourself, you will focus on your imperfections and your insecurities. If you zoom in too much, you'll miss the essence of the event. And today, beloved, as we pull over on our journey of becoming to celebrate our first anniversary as pastor and people, we have come, beloved, a long way. 12 months, we've gone from being strangers to pastor and people. 12 months, we've gone from being, I've gone from, from being Rashid and Rashid and all kinds of stuff to being reverend, to being pastor. We've gone from questions and frustration to patience and love. Moving forward in faith and looking back in praise. Let us see this morning this text to see what the Lord has to say to us on our, not my, but our first anniversary. I'm, I'm not coming to condemn Moses this morning. I just want to park my car next to Moses this morning to see what the message is in the mystery. Lord, what is it that you're trying to tell us on this first anniversary as pastor and people? Three suggestions I have for you this morning as we look at this text and we will move forward. The first one that we find in this text is God is giving us a, a message about how to deal with great work, how to deal with great and unfinished work. The first lesson we learn is that you've got to zoom out and make sure that God is in the picture. You've got to zoom out, beloved, and to make sure that God is in the picture. It's interesting to note, beloved, in this text that Moses' objections are always about him. All of his objections are about him. What if they don't listen to me? What if they don't believe in me? You know I study. You know that I stammer. You know that I'm not fit for the job. All of his objections are about him. And beloved, when we zoom too much in on ourselves, we give more attention to our issues rather than our gifts. We zoom in on our weaknesses and cut out our strengths. We zoom in on our blemishes and lose everything that is beautiful about ourselves. We zoom in so much that we can tell what's wrong with us rather than everything that is right about us. And here, beloved, God reminds Moses that you were made in the imago day. You were made in the image of God, stuttering and stammering. You, you've got a record, but you were made in the image of God. You are a reflection of God. And never forget that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. And marvelous are thy works, O Lord, my soul knows it right well. Beloved, God has created us and formed us with all of our imperfections and all of our possibilities. When we zoom in too close on ourselves, <laughs> we cut God out of the frame. We can't see God working in us and through us. We don't see God in us. When I look back on the last year, 
I realized that God put us together just at the right time. Oh, I'm going to be transparent this morning because I ain't got no reason to lie. I ain't, ain't no lie in me. You know, when I first began to hear about First Baptist and the possibility of becoming its pastor or being introduced as a suggestion or a recommendation to be pastor, I, you know, I said, Lord, I don't, mm -mm, I'm not ready. I was comfortable where I was, comfortable sitting on the second seat on the pulpit of Abyssinian doing my work, minding my business. I, I, Lord, I'm good. And after I realized, it ain't about you. When, you. when God calls you, it's not up to you to tell God what you're going to do. God is a supervisor. You don't tell a supervisor what you're going to do. God said, I, who called you? And after a while, I realized that I had to zoom out a little bit. Because my ministry, the calling on my life is not about me. It's not about me. I realized that God was doing something that I did not imagine. I did not, you did not imagine 12 months ago that we would be living through a pandemic. You hear what I'm saying? 12 months ago, we never imagined that we would have an empty sanctuary for eight months. But God fixed it so. And every now and again, I've learned, you got to zoom out. It ain't about you. Humble yourself. It ain't about you. The call of your life is not about you. And God had to remind Moses, Moses, it ain't about you. You're worried about you stuttering. You need to worry about the fact that there are millions of people suffering under slavery in Egypt. That is the focus. It ain't about you. I'm done with that. But you got to learn. One lesson I learned, we, we, we passed the people. Now, one thing you got to learn is you got to be gracious to yourself. Beloved, we are so hard on ourselves. Stutter, I stammer. I, I'm, you got to see, you have to begin to see yourself the way that God sees you. Be gracious to yourself. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to study. You're going to make mistakes. Every sermon won't be great. Every solo you give ain't great. But you've got to learn how to be gracious to yourself because God is not looking for perfection. God is looking for faithfulness. Stop worrying about your stuttering and put the focus on the big picture. But secondly, you've got to zoom out and you've got to see the big picture. You got to zoom out and see the big picture. This story that you are a part of, this story of becoming, it did not start with you and it's not going to end with you. Humble yourself. I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to myself. Moses was so focused on himself that he failed to realize that the story was not about him. It was about the millions of people who were suffering in Egypt. God Here's it. God does not call us to titles. God calls us to work. In this season, it's not about your title. It's, a, it's not about what they call you. It's about what you do. Because oftentimes, your title doesn't say anything about what you do. Yeah, they call you teacher, but really, you are more so like a father and a mother to 30 children in a classroom on Zoom. God never called, not only are you the parents, <laughs> you a teacher, not only are you the parents to the, the students, sometimes you got to be parents to the parents. I'm going to leave that alone. But you know what I'm talking about. God never called Moses to a position. God said, I have seen the oppression of my people. I've seen the uh, cries of my people. I've seen their affliction. And I'm not calling you to a position. I'm calling you to the work of freeing my people. And beloved, when we get wrapped up in our titles and our positions, we lose sight of the great work. The calling is always a response to a need. Rashad, it ain't about you. Moses, it ain't about you. It's about the people who are suffering. It's about the people who are crying out. It's about the people who need a word. It's about the generation that is coming behind you. And when you measure, <laughs> and when you measure your stuttering against other people's suffering, you'll realize that your stuttering really doesn't matter. And this is why we celebrate on this Sunday, not just me, you celebrate pastoring people because we have passed one of the greatest tests that many organizations never pass. The real secret to your success as a church, the real secret to your success as any organization, institution, is can the church survive when the founder is gone? That's real. A lot of people start churches and the churches die with them. 
But you've got to have a vision that sees beyond. So this morning, we don't just celebrate me. We celebrate the gift of our founding pastor, Dr. Clarence Norman Sr. We, we celebrate the gift of our second pastor, Reverend Blutzel. Yes, the road has been rough, and yes, it's been rocky waves, but the good news is that the church continues to grow, and the legacy continues to stand strong, even beyond the founder, because God gave that man a vision 66 years ago that it would last beyond you. And the real secret to great work is to commit yourself to something that will last longer than you. To plant a tree that's going to grow and flourish long after we're gone. One day I'm not going to be here. One day we're not going to be here. But the idea is that we will live in such a way that our children and our children's children will be able to continue this great work far beyond us. And you are not perfect. I'm not perfect. But God is not asking us to be perfect. God is simply asking us to be faithful. Faithful. But thirdly, this is good news to me. <laughs> the work is great, yet it's still unfinished. The work is great. This is a real humbling sermon. I, I was trying to preach it and get happy, but I'm starting to think about it. This work is so great. But it's still yet unfinished. When I came to First Baptist, Reverend D. Dow Griffin, who used to be the pastor of Antioch, said to me, he says, now the first project you have when you get to First Baptist is you need to understand that you are about to come into a movie that started 66 years ago. <laughs> and your first job on the first day is to try to catch up. Because the movie's not going to start over after 66 years. You've got to figure out the history, you got to learn the stories, and you got to figure out who the characters are. You got to figure out who the characters are. And a part of that, y'all, it takes patience to realize who's who and what's what. The beauty of it is that it's great, but it's still yet unfinished. And the beauty of it, y'all, is that we can't celebrate, we just can't celebrate great work. The secret to it is you've got to finish the great work. It is an interesting reality to note that many of our greatest works of art were left unfinished. Whether we are talking about music or literature or social movements or cathedrals, the fact is there is a body of great work in every aspect of human endeavor, but yet there's some works that were left unfinished. Some works were left unfinished because people died. Other works were left unfinished because people ran out of money. We don't know what happened. We all, all we know is that life happened and the great work was never finished. There is the great St. John the Divine Cathedral on 110th Street in Manhattan. And believe it or not, they say that that building will never, ever be finished. They say that according to the plans, it will take another 600 years to finish that cathedral. It is great. But it is still unfinished. Beloved, we live in a world that is incomplete and imperfect and unfinished. And guess what? You can be great and still unfinished. In the world of publishing, in order for a book to be printed, it has to be finished. When a writer dies and leaves an unfinished book, it becomes the responsibility of editors and scholars and executors of the estate to make sense of what was left and to finish it. I'm going somewhere. There is something beautiful and terrifying about unfinished work. What's terrifying about unfinished work is that it requires something of us. It's one thing to acknowledge a masterpiece, but it's another thing to roll up your sleeves and get to work in order to finish it. At some point in your life, you have to muster up the courage and the faith and the imagination to complete that which has been left unfinished. Can you believe that? That you, yourself, with all of what you know about you, your stuttering and your stammering self, that God has called you to finish a great work. I know that sounds crazy to you, but the truth is that the church as we know it, as great as it is, it still is un. Finish. I know this may sound sacrilegious, but get this. God needs you as much as you need God. There are some things that God can't do in the world until you say yes to his will and yes to his way. St. Teresa of Avila said, Christ has no body 
on earth but ours. And Christ has no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Beloved, God cannot continue to heal people unless there are doctors who study and think. God's voice can't be heard unless we speak. How shall we hear without a preacher? God cannot save some people unless you are willing to teach, unless you are willing to testify, unless you are willing to mentor, unless you are willing to pray, to care, to counsel, to guide, and show them the way. God cannot answer some of our prayers until we are willing to be the answers to our own prayers. You are a child of God, and your playing small does not serve the world. It is only when we give ourselves over to reading and to writing and to creating and to imagining and to serving and to mentoring and to teaching and to praying and to building and planting and raising money and keeping books that God is able to accomplish what God will. And as great as God is, beloved, God does not build bridges. God does not build tunnels. God does not build cathedrals. Instead, God gives us the skills in order to think big and to imagine new possibilities and to write and to think and to imagine a world that is not yet. God has given us every skill. Yes, stuttering. He's given us skills. Yes, stammering. He's given us skills. Yes, we ghetto, but God has given us gifts. Yes, we're ratchet, but God still gives us gifts. And now unto, now unto him who's able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ever ask or think according to the power that is in us. Beloved, I want you to know this morning, I'm so happy. I'm so overjoyed. I'm so honored to be the pastor of First Baptist. But the great news, beloved, is that God is still calling us forward. Beloved, we can talk all day about what God has done over the last 66 years, but we also celebrate that the story still continues. And that is what Jesus was trying to get the disciples to understand in John. Jesus said, look, y'all, I am about to die. Them folk are getting ready to kill me. They're coming after me. But the good news is, Jesus says, I'm going to put the same spirit that's in me is in you. And in John, Jesus says, greater things shall you do than this. Greater things shall you do than I did. Why? Because I am in you. And the work that I've been doing is now given to you. Beloved, we are the church. We are the ones that God has called to continue the work. He who has begun a good work in you is faithful to perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. Now, beloved, that's it. On this great pastoral anniversary, I honor you. I thank you for the poem. I thank you for the well wishes. But I'm so excited because God is still doing great work. You, you're asking, Reverend, what are you talking about? I'm going to be real with you. I know how hard and how painful it is to see a church die. I know how painful it is to see visions die. Die because there were people who did not step up to the plate. I know what it's like to see a church die because people could not latch on to the vision. I know what it's like to see a church die because of the selfishness of those who would not allow God to move. But I celebrate this morning because the story of First Baptist continues to shine on for another generation. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask, think, or imagine unto that God who is able to go beyond our wildest dreams. <laughs> now to God who's able to go beyond our wildest dreams. I'm closing now, but every time I think about great work, I think about my favorite movie. Oh, my favorite movie, I told you before, is The Preacher's Wife. And it's that one scene with Dudley. And Dudley and the little boy Jeremiah. Jeremiah has this little truck. And this little ambulance truck stopped working. I don't know what happened to it, but the truck stopped working. And one day, the angel Dudley comes over to the house, and Jeremiah is a little upset. Dudley picks up the truck and says to Jeremiah, Now, son, tell me what happened to the truck. Jeremiah says, You know, I really don't know what happened to it. It stopped working. Well, the angel took this old little truck that did not work, 
he put his hand on it. And when he put his hand on it, the lights lit up. And when he put his hand on it, the sirens came on. And Jeremiah said, it never had a siren before. And Dudley hit the truck because the truck was making so much noise. And in that moment, he went beyond the little boy's imagination. He went beyond what the little boy thought was possible. He went beyond what the little boy thought could ever happen. And beloved, I'm telling you now that if there's one thing that you ought to know about God, that God will go beyond your wildest imagination. God will get glory out of your life that you never thought. God will call you out of Brooklyn, out of bed as a knucklehead in the classroom and then call you back to Brooklyn to be a pastor. God will go beyond your wildest dreams. And and God will get something out of you with your stuttering, stammering, ghetto, ratchet, whatever you got going on behind your life, God can get it. God can get it. And that is the beauty of the gospel, that God takes fishermen and calls them to be fishers of people. God takes Peter and calls him to be the rock of the church. God takes a stuttering Moses and calls him to be the leader of his people. God does all of this with ordinary people. And when you put your life into the hands of a great God, God will continue to call you to finish great, but yet unfinished work. This is our prayer. This is what we celebrate, a great and glorious God. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen.